Hello, how are you doing? Well, so let's uh, get uh, started. I'm going to be talking about uh, effective Java with uh, Groovy. A uh, little bit about uh, me. Uh, I'm a developer, coach, and uh, consultant. And uh, I'm also founder and organizer of uh, Bangalore uh, uh, Groovy user group. With that, let's uh, get started. Well, we see the, the knowledge uh, pyramid over here. At the bottom, we have uh, data. And uh, data is in abundant but uh, mm -hmm. each data might not be that much uh, valuable. But when you process data and uh, extract information out of that, it's much more valuable. And we climb the knowledge tree over there to reach uh, knowledge and uh, finally wisdom when you, when you are able to identify uh, patterns across the context and are able to generalize and decide what is right or what is wrong with the context. Same thing can be applied to the books, what we use, right? Some, some of them may be at uh, knowledge level, some of, very few of them would be at uh, the wisdom level. Being a Java developer, many of you might have uh, read the uh, effective Java book. How many of you have uh, read the book? Excellent. So in my opinion, uh, this is one of the book which, which, which can uh, you know, withstand the time for longer duration, especially if the books are talking about the syntax, they may, they may survive only a shorter period of time, but if they are talking about what is the right way to design things, then definitely they, they are going to last long. Well, Groovy is a language on running on uh, JVM, right? So the question comes here is, Effective, since Groovy runs on JVM, how much of effective Java is applicable to Groovy? Interestingly, to look at what was the purpose of uh, Groovy as such, it was designed to make developers uh, more productive. Of course, during uh, those days, the, the choice was to uh, create a dynamic language. So, what do you think about this? Is that right? Yes, of course, but uh, is it of any use? That's not right. It's technically perfect, but uh, a completely useless message. So we, we want to avoid these things and uh, go to, you know, uh, navigate this and, uh, you know, in, in this context, you are able to see, okay, this is where you are and, uh, you know, uh, and you can navigate uh, wherever you want. So let's set up uh, some of those things for uh, this uh, presentation. And here are uh, some of the pattern I'll be using uh, to navigate uh, this topic. So we will start with the context or uh, problem. And uh, whenever we have a problem, what we need to do is we go to Effective Java and say what is mentioned there and try to implement that so, so we come up with a good implementation. However, Reusing Java implementation may not be always uh, the right thing to do in uh, Groovy. So we will see some of those uh, traps which you should potentially try to avoid. And then we see the groovier way of uh, implementing uh, effective Java techniques. And uh, finally, we will summarize the uh, you know, lessons uh, learned, which will include uh, you know, some of the tools the language uses to make effective Java really effective in Groovy, as well as in general about uh, designing programs, what do we learn? That, that's the wisdom aspect of that. With that, let's start. Let me start with this class. I have a class called uh, product, which has uh, several uh, attributes. With that, I go to here. So I create uh, you know, instance of the products. So in this case, I'm taking uh, books. So book one and book two, and I'm supplying the same values everywhere. Then I'm trying to see if book one equals uh, book two. Uh, this is a groovy equals. What do you think would be the result of this? That's false, but 
we would want it to be true. Similarly, we, I create a map called uh, stock here, right, with the groovy syntax. Then I set 100 as the value with the book one as the key here. And I try to retrieve value from the map using book two as the key. What would be the result here? happens to be null, but ideally we would want the, the stock 100 to appear. If you look at the reason why this happens, Java, the topmost you know, class in the hierarchy, which is an object, provides uh, these methods, which is uh, you know, equals as well as uh, hash code. Since we had not overridden in our class, it's going to take the implementation from the base class which is like uh, only if, you know, if both references are pointing to the same instance, only in that case they will be equals. And hash code will be unique in that case to the instance. Let's see what does effective Java say here. So it says uh, obey the general contract when overriding uh, equals, and then always override uh, hash code when you override uh, equals. Well, which, which can be, you know, uh, take us some time to understand and uh, implement that. But once you understand what could be the potential problems when you are uh, doing it with Java. These are the classes uh, from uh, Apache Commons Lang library. So they provide uh, equals builder and uh, hash code builder, which we might want to use there. This is how uh, you would uh, use one of them. Say, you know, within equals, you use the equal builder and uh, you know, right, right, uh, which are the fields should be considered uh, in uh, equals in, or, or for equality. But the challenge here is, you know, your equals as well as hash code should depend on the same set of fields. But right now you're writing two separate implementations using uh, equals builder and hash code builder. So there is a chance that you might use, uh, you know, uh, two different uh, set of fields accidentally, of course. So. The problem we see here is there is no single representation of uh, these fields, which is one of the challenges uh, we have here. Another aspect is the classes keep growing over a period of time. So we add more fields, but do we remember to go and update uh, equals and hash code? Sometimes it may not be, you know, when, when some, the developer is looking at the class, might not be able to readily see equals and overrides, so it's a possi possibility of uh, missing that. So these are some of the challenges uh, which could lead to problems. Let's see what Groovy offers. Groovy offers an ASG transformation called uh, equals and hash code. So by default, uh, it, it's considering all the fields, or uh, in this case, I'm using uh, this class uh, as a value object, not as an entity. So now, I run the same code, which returns true, and uh, in the case of uh, you know, hash code, I get the value back. So that, that's how Groovy makes your life uh, simple. However, if you are uh, writing entities, there could be some challenges. Do you see any problem with this code? That's fine. The challenge here is I have used ID as a field on which the equality and the hash code should be dependent. So I create an object. It's not persisted. ID will not be present at that time. When you persist, ID changes. As a result, your hash code uh, might change. So you should not use uh, the gener auto-generated IDs uh, as uh, you know, uh, fields for uh, writing equals and hash code. So the correct way to implement here would be the relying upon the business key, in this case, the you know, uh, stock keeping unit. Well, so what did we learn here? The tool that we used is a ESD transformation, or what the language provided us. And uh, what we learned is the single point of uh, representation of any knowledge, or single responsibility principle, is been automatically you know, uh, used in what uh, Groovy offers. 
Let's move on to the next one. What do you think of this? <laughs> well, it's, it's uh, common to see in our uh, code as well, right? That things can be complex, but what is causing the complexity here? It's, it has a lot of moving parts, <laughs> right? So you don't know <laughs> what should be where. So one of the, the ideas that uh, effective Java say is uh, prefer for each loop to the traditional for each loop so that you have uh, fewer moving paths. Let's uh, take that and literally uh, take the literal meaning of that and implement it in uh, Groovy. So we have uh, you know for uh, in loop we could use that, but uh, that that's not how uh, you should interpret. Uh, the idea. Instead, if we look at here, so we use the each higher order method which can accept a closure. So you essentially you are moving from an external iterator to internal iterator. This is okay for a simple iteration and uh, it's doing something, it doesn't return anything. However, if you want to perform a map operation which is called as uh, you know collect in uh, Groovy, the transformation, again, you could use the specific uh, collect method here. And similarly, you could use uh, the inject for uh, reduce operations. So the, the iterator part is not just uh, when I, whenever I say external iterator to internal iterator, you know, it could be not just using each always, but using some of these uh, you know, methods like uh, you know, collect, inject also. So what did we learn here? Again, the techniques is uh, closures as uh, you know, higher order functions. And uh, the, what did we learn here is the, the way you should interpret uh, you know, for each loop instead of the traditional for loop in Groovy is Favor internal iterators to external iterators. And uh, minimize the moving parts. That those will save you time. Let's move on to the next agenda. This is a Java code. What do you think would be the output of this? I have a product of worth, uh, you know, Point one dollars or euros, anything. Then I buy ten such items. What would be the result? Say if you're running business and, uh, or say if you're a customer <laughs> buying something, would you be happy with this result? Now. Let's use double instead of float and see what would the result. Now the business owner will not be happy with this result. <laughs> so what does Java, effective Java say about this? So whenever you need an accurate result, like uh, you know, the currencies, you should avoid float and double, and you should be using a big decimal. Let's put that into Groovy. This is still in uh, Java. Now, what would be the result? I'm using big decimal now instead of uh, float or double. That's what you get. Still, we are not happy. What's the reason why we got this in spite of using big decimal? So while constructing big decimal, we used uh, you know, a double value here, so while the value is stored in double itself, it lost the precision, so now there is no way to recover from uh, there. Instead, you should use the string. Let's write the similar code in uh, Groovy. I'm using a def here. I'm not specifying the exact uh, type of it. Now, what would be the result? <coughs> it's producing one. To understand why this is happening here, let's add a few more lines of code. I'm uh, printing the type of uh, price as well as total. So you see big decimal as has been used here. 
So the default value what Groovy chose itself can prevent a lot of issues, right? So if people use double or float instead of big decimal in your Java code, you know, it can lead to a lot of problems. I, I have heard a lot of, uh, you know, few <coughs> financial institutions using such code and, uh, you know, ended up in uh, trouble there. So if you look at the time period in which uh, Java was developed, I would still say, you know, business applications were quite common there. Something like, uh, you know, using that IEEE standard would not have been great, but the motivation for uh, developing Java language, you know, which was not to be used in a business application, instead it is more of in the, you know, electronics equipments, that says why, uh, you know, the uh, float or double became the, you know, the standard there. So what did we learn here? Selecting appropriate default value is very important, can save you a lot of time. And uh, principle of uh, least astonishment, typically, you know, uh, somebody reading the code will not expect uh, uh, to get, uh, you know, values like 1.0001 kind of thing. You, that, that's, so as it, it's important to design uh, your APIs uh, so that uh, people are not uh, surprised. Let's go on to the next uh, topic. I have a class called person which has uh, name and age, and I have a bunch of objects, and I want to sort these objects. Looking at effective Java, it says uh, consider implementing comparable so that you can uh, order your objects within a collection. Let's see how Groovy simplifies this. Groovy comes up with something called a spaceship operator. That's that less than equals uh, greater than sign. This is how uh, it would uh, work. If the first number is smaller, it's minus one. If they are equals, uh, it's zero. And if the first number is larger, it would result in a plus one. So let's use these in implementing uh, comparable. So what we end up here is You have a spaceship operator used here, which makes the implementation you know, down to one line. Otherwise, you'd have write few if-else statements. Now, how would we call this? Typically, you would have used uh, geeks.sort without passing that uh, uh, Boolean argument. In that case, it will, uh, it will manipulate the original collection. If you pass a Boolean argument as false, instead of manipulating the original, uh, you know, the geeks collection or list, it will return a new list in a specified order, so that the original values are not, uh, original collection is not changed. So that would be the result. Now say, instead of uh, name, let's name is still the default or order I want to use, but in a specific case, I want to go with the, say, order by each. So in Java, you would pass a you know, comparator. In Groovy, you could uh, pass a closure here, which takes uh, two arguments, A and B. And then again, I use the spaceship operator to implement the comparison. Let's go one step ahead and say, now we want to order them in age and name. That is, if two people have same age, then name should be used for uh, you know, resolving that. Typically, you will end up writing something uh, like this, right? You have to check one by one first age. If the age is not equal anywhere, you can return immediately. Otherwise, you would have to go, go to the next field and uh, you know, check the values there. So, so the kind of uh, uh, you know, the value zero is being used to avoid uh, the, you know, the, the ELSIF ladder you know, anti-pattern. However, it, it can get very complicated when, as the number of uh, fields grow. A solution, a groovier solution, is to make use of a uh, find result. That is, I will have a collection, a list of closures, right? Each closure is kind, kind of trying to get uh, the specific field, I mean, specific, op, I mean, the you know, value from the instance. So first, I want, uh, 
by age, and then I want by name, so I have to give it in that order, and then call the find result. So find result kind of uh, will keep on going until it finds a non-zero result. So effectively, you will end up uh, implementing the same technique in a easier way and uh, much more uh, readable way. However, with the, I believe, Groovy version 2.4, we have a ESD transformation called uh, sortable available, where you can uh, specify the fields, and uh, things get uh, fairly easy. So what did we learn here? The spaceship operator is a syntactic sugar, which helps uh, in writing very fewer lines of code and expressing your intention very clearly and making the code more readable. And we also use the sortable ASD transformation. And uh, the wisdom here is uh, you know, simplify <coughs> common tasks. That, that will, again, save a lot of time, because something like uh, ordering is a very, very common thing in programming. With that, let's move on to the next question. What is this? million dollar effort in typical Java applications. What is the most common thing people do? Any idea? Which is not good, obviously. Null checks. If, if you don't design your program <laughs> correctly, maybe a lot of, uh, a significant percentage of your code would be doing uh, null checks. Let's take a scenario. So. I have a method called uh, get speakers, which returns a list of uh, speaker objects. But I decide somehow it returns null in certain cases. So in this case, I directly hard coded it as null. So it's always going to return uh, null. So what happens is whenever you want to use the list returned from this method, you will have to use the null check always, right? So you have to say, if it is not null, use that, otherwise you will end up with the null pointer exception. Regarding this point, the book says uh, written empty arrays or collections, not nulls. But not everybody follows this, right? So that, that's the challenge you have. But let's say you are in a team of all Groovy developers, right? And some mischievous developers decide to return null you know, instead of an uh, empty collection. And what happens? So I'm going to call the get speakers. And I'm going to call collect, which is a map operation on that. And I'm trying to get the first name. Similarly, I'm going to call, which is going to return null, right? Again, call find all on that. What would you expect? In both cases, I get empty list. So even if some developers wanted to cause trouble to others, so that uh, you know the entire week they can write, uh, they can you know keep on writing null checks. But then, uh, if you are in Groovy, you are escaped from that, and uh, Groovy takes care of that. How did it, how did this happen? Because Groovy uses something called uh, null object, and uh, you know whenever you are calling the iterator on uh, null object, it returns an uh, you know, em empty collection. In this case, it's a list. And if you're going to call any other uh, method on null object, it's going to throw null pointer exception. Because it's, it's, it's very specific to the collection types. Can you say recently changes in the size? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that, that's to have a common uh, you know, uh, uh, function across uh, you know, uh, collections, uh, arrays, and all kind of things, right? Right, but I mean, you used to throw a null pointer if you tried to fix size. Obviously, yeah. If, if, if I try to call size, it, it's going to do that. I thought it recently changed those to return zero. Oh, OK. Maybe. I'm not too sure about that. Uh, yeah, no problem. So again, we used. Uh, Null object pattern as the tool. And the, the benefit we got is uh, we don't have to write a lot of boilerplate code, boiler code anymore. 
saving us a lot of time for writing the actual business code. And life is too short for doing null checks. Right? There are other things to be delivered. With that, let's move on to Gang of Four design patterns. One of the design patterns the effective Java book talks about is uh, singleton, and it says uh, enforce the singleton property with a private constructor or an enum type. Let's try to use this uh, implementation in Groovy. So I'm creating a class called uh, manager. As recommended, I have a static final field, you know, and uh, then I just have a get, get instance static method, which returns the instance which is already created. I'm trying to call the get instance twice and comparing if they're equals, as expected, they happen to be you know, equal. So that, that means only one instance has been created. So far, we are good. But I'm trying to call the constructor now and create an object. What would happen in this case? Well, fails here. It's going to return a new object. Ideally, it should not have allowed people to you know, call the constructor, right? though we, though, even though we made it uh, private. Well, you don't have to do all these things to implement singleton in Groovy. All you have to do is uh, use uh, the AST transformation singleton. And uh, now I'm going to call the same get instance method twice, and uh, they're going to be true. And I'm trying to call the constructor. In this case, I get an uh, you know, exception saying, uh, you know, can't instantiate uh, singleton. You have to use uh, manager.instance or manager.get instance. Good. However, what if we don't want to create the resource right in the beginning? We want to kind of have a you know a, a lazy creation of the object. That is, if at all the ob the in single instance is required, then only we want to create that. Otherwise, we don't want to create the object and keep it. Maybe it's a costly resource. How would we do that? One challenge is you have to use the synchronized uh, keyword, which might be missed often, which, which will make sure that only one thread is accessing that. Otherwise, if two threads are simultaneously uh, calling the get instance method, two instances would get created. That's not enough, right? We also have to mark that instance as uh, volatile so that the changes are always reflected in the memory and not just in the cache, so that the other thread is able to see the change. So even though it sounds very simple, it, it, it has a lot of uh, you know, complications, and we have to keep several factors in mind. There's one more disadvantage associated with the marking the entire method as uh, synchronized, because in the entire duration of the application, the instance is going to be created only once. Now that instance is created, say there are 100 threads accessing the instance which is already created, but only one thread can access at a time, which, which is a huge disadvantage associated with this code. So typically, people go for the double-checked uh, lock pattern so that you, you synchronize only the, only the creation of it, not the retrieval of that. What Groovy makes is it provides uh, just, just a value to that, the same uh, AST transformation singleton. By default, it's eager, not lazy. However, you can say lazy true, and it will add these, it will generate this code. Now you would see we are doing the you know, double uh, check locking here. The creation is uh, synchronized. However, you know, if, the, if the values are uh, not uh, null, it's not synchronized, so multiple threads can access the code uh, together. Again, the tool is uh, AST transformation. And uh, important aspect is uh, you know, the, the, learn the principle used here is uh, Yagni. You ain't going to need it 
yet, right? So if you don't need lazy, don't go and implement all the complicated things. Do it simple. If it is required, you can always uh, enable that. And again, uh, trying to overgeneralize can be a, you know, a, a very bad thing. Let's move on to the next item. What are we going to talk about here? It's about the side effects. With functional languages becoming more predominant, I believe people are familiar with the side effects. So kind of uh, people are understanding it's not good to have side effects, or at least you know, it, it should be done in a very, very uh, cautious way. Now the effective Java talks about uh, mutability, and it says minimize mutability and we should favor immutability. That's OK, but how do you create a class that is immutable? There are certain rules to be followed. And uh, well, you say to the developers, these are the rules to be followed. Start reading, OK, don't provide any mutators. Go to the next. And by the time you reach third, you feel oh, I have a lot of work to be finished. There's no time to read all these things. And you go and make everything mutable. Right? That, that's one of the disadvantages. Another challenge here is if, you, if your class has a lot of fields, you, know, you can't have getters and setters. I mean, you can't have setters, specifically. So what you would need is you would need a constructor which takes all the arguments. So if you have 10 fields, it will be a constructor with the then arguments, and using this constructor can be fairly challenging things because how do you remember the order? Right. Let's come to Groovy and see how it helps here. Again, as expected, Groovy provides uh, an ASD transformation called uh, immutable. In this case, uh, I have a class rectangle with two fields. And look at the way I'm invoking uh, the constructor here. I'm not, uh, you know, passing them uh, uh, in certain order. Instead, I'm using more like a named argument kind of thing. So it's a uh, length 10, breadth 5. So the code is very, very readable. And uh, you know, with the auto completion, it would be fairly easy to uh, write, use these constructors as well. Now, how does this work under the hood? Let's look at that. So whenever you mark a class as immutable, for that class, Groovy generates a constructor which accepts a map argument. So in this case, it says hash map args. So when you write a constructor with the named arguments, it converts them into a map and you know, passes on to this particular constructor, which makes the life easy. Now it is readable, and still you know, we have uh, uh, immutable uh, class with all the recommendations mentioned there. You don't have to specifically worry about implementing you know, them one by one. Again, ASD transformation has been used here. A uh, bit of syntactic sugar in uh, converting your, uh, you know, the key values, the arguments, the constructor to a map. You don't explicitly say a map there. Right? You don't have to. And. Uh, Readability matters, and uh, any support that language provides is really appreciated. With that, we move on to the next. What does it look like? <laughs> it's a golden hammer, right? <laughs> Which is an uh, you know anti-pattern. So. With respect to Java, what do you think is the golden hammer? That's inheritance, right? Maybe the number one uh, abused feature <laughs> of the language. So well, again, the effective Java says favor composition over uh, inheritance. Let's take an example. Say I want to implement a custom collection here to represent uh, some of the phone numbers. And I want to call all the methods which are available in the collections. In this case, a find, find all, etc. And also, I want to add uh, some uh, specific, uh, you know, uh, additional methods. Like, uh, say, in this case, I want to find out all the 
four numbers that belong to India. What is the first design choice comes to your mind? Well, people will say, I know effective Java says uh, I should go for uh, composition, not inheritance, right? But then uh, how many methods does list uh, you know, interface has? Maybe a few dozens, right? So I'll have to create all methods in my class and then call, redirect it to the implementation that uh, list will use, which is going to take a lot of time. So people will say, OK, even though I understand composition is better, but let me not go there. right? So let me finish the coding for today and uh, consider it doing that tomorrow. And that tomorrow never comes. So this is a bad choice in this case, because it doesn't follow the list of substitution principle. right? It essentially, it's not falling into the same interface. The reason why you are going for the inheritance here is that you want to reuse the functionality available in the base class. Instead, Groovy provides something called uh, delegate. So I have a value here, phone numbers, which is a list. And whenever a method, and uh, whenever a method is called on the instance of this collection, if the method is available directly within this class, that is four numbers, it will get called. For example, uh, you know, if you call Indian numbers, this method will get called. But instead, if you call find, find all, collect, anything like that, those methods are not available anywhere here. However, those will be delegated to you know, the list phone number. So that you don't have to write all, the, all those uh, method signatures and then you know, redirect it to the implementation. That's how uh, Groovy simplifies implementing composition. In addition to this, Groovy also provides uh, traits. So especially if you want to compose behaviors, you know, you could go ahead and create uh, traits. In this case, I have two traits called can sing and uh, can dance. And wherever uh, you want to use that, use it like uh, you know interfaces. So person implements these two traits, now you could call the methods from uh, traits on the object. So that, that's typically, if, if it is specific to behaviors, you, you would favor uh, a trait. What did we learn? Again, we used a lot of ASC transformation. And uh, make it simple for developers so that they can focus on the value, not on the boilerplate. Well, these were some of the recommendations uh, from uh, Effective Java, and we saw how uh, you know they play within Groovy. So copy pasting or reusing the implementation may not be a good thing, but uh, all of those recommendations they do have a lot of uh, value, and Some of them are built into the language, like the big decimal choice. You don't have to do anything as a developer. It, it's right, baked right into the language. And ESD transformation emerged to be you know, the, in the most of the cases what we saw, which is a very, very uh, handy technique, which can, uh, you know, a lot, especially like uh, you know, the, the language already pro comes with a set of ESD transformation, which you, which you could uh, readily use, which can save a lot of time. And uh, we saw some of those uh, traps where uh, even though the ideas are uh, very much relevant, but using the implementation may not be the way to go. And interestingly, I mean, over a period of time, uh, what, I mean, what, what I was able to see here is that, you know, Programming languages can you know, reduce the friction to implement uh, good practices. So especially we saw in the case of uh, favoring uh, composition. Right? So if the language makes it easy for the developers to implement the right practices, I believe the chances, chances of uh, developers doing it right is more 
then you have to put a lot of effort and uh, you know get it done kind of thing and especially you know something like uh, est transformation is available to you groovy developers so you don't have to wait for anything to be implemented in the language instead you could write your own um, est transformation and uh, influence how the code is generated by the compiler so that the tool that makes the language very much powerful is available to you the developers as well which which is a very very interesting uh, point to be noted so essentially what what i ended up uh, understanding here is a language can influence developers to adopt the good practices in in in, in a, you know that that influence is very much critical and it can vary from uh, you know languages to language well that's all i had for this session hope you enjoyed it thank you any questions Well, I think it's it's okay to use that uh, if you have uh, very few attributes. Um, of course, in my example, I had just two of them just for illustration. But in reality, as the number of uh, attributes uh, increases, uh, I believe the readability will uh, come down, and uh, it could be hard to maintain in that case. Whereas uh, in uh, you know find result, I have all my closures available right within my collection, so I could read it pretty easily. Thank you very much. Well, thank you.